everyone so this video um, I'm gonna go over the first part of tissue um, this is what we would have done in lab if we met today but obviously I'm not feeling well so uh, it's probably not best that we met um, so I'm gonna do two different videos one for the half the two different the types of tissue and then I'll do another video for the other two that we would cover next class and that way you could watch both these videos at home and then we could spend the entire lab next time just looking at slides and we don't have to really talk about anything. Alright so for this video we're going to cover two major tissue types. We're going to talk about epithelial tissue and connective tissue um, but before we get into all that we should just kind of reinforce this whole idea of hierarchy when it comes to biology. Um, we've said it a hundred times now, right? Cells are the base unit of life, and that is because they are self-sustaining and they could reproduce. And um, most processes in the body can be traced back to the cell, um, just with the cell shape or what special structures it might have or what special chemistry it might do for your body. Um, so most processes can be traced back to that. Um, cells don't work alone, though. Um, there's trillions of cells in your body, and they work together in tissue. Um, so that's the next level up really. And with tissue, we have a bunch of similar cells working together to do something for your body. So in this example here, we might have a single smooth muscle cell um, doing some sort of function, but when you get a bunch of smooth muscle cells together working as a whole tissue, this whole unit, you kind of magnify that function. Um, and then the next level up is organs. So organs is two or more tissue layers that are working together to do something. So um, all the organs in your body are at least two tissues. Um, so that they're, again, working together to do something for your body. And then one level above that is organ systems. That's everything that we covered on that first class, all the different organ systems. Those are just a group of organs that are working together to achieve a common goal or a common function for your body. And then all those organ systems come together to make an organism. And that's actually where the term's coming from. And that's what we mean by the organismal level. All right, so just so you have a definition, uh, tissue is a group of similar cells working together. So this is epithelial tissue right here um, from a cheek swab. You probably did this in GB1. Um, but for you to be able to identify tissue, you need to be able to identify the cells that make up that tissue. Um, so I have this little image in here just as a kind of a recap. Out here is the plasma membrane of the cell. You can kind of see the shape of the cell here. In the center is the nucleus. Nuclei usually stain a dark purple color with most stains. And from there, we could see that there's a bunch of similar cells all together from this epithelial tissue that you collected with the cheek swab. <clears throat> all right, and then for your organ definition, it is going to be two or more tissues working together to achieve a certain function for your body. Um, most of the organs in our body are hollow tubes. Um, you can kind of think of us as a bunch of hollow tubes. Uh, just as an example, here's a stomach right here. So if you cut open a stomach, you'll see it's hollow on the inside and then you have layers of tissue going towards um, more superficially. Um, so because of that, we have to know how we can cut open an organ. And you'll probably see this on the slides when we get to lab and you actually take a look at these slides. Um, so there's different ways we can cut open an organ to put them on a slide and actually look view at them. One way is through a cross section. So a cross section would be cutting the organ down its short length. And we have to take a very thin slice of that short length. And what that would look like on our slide is a tube, like a nice circle. You'll see the center that is open and then you'll see the tissues radiating outwards. Or we could do a longitudinal section, which is going to be the length of the organ. And that is gonna look more like uh, two layers of tissue going straight across and an opening in the center. All right, so we have a term for this opening that is inside all your hollow organs. We call this the lumen. So whenever you see that open space inside the organ, that's just the lumen. And we have directional terms when it comes to histology, which is the, the science of looking at this under a microscope. Um, if something is towards the lumen, we say it's more apical, all right? While if something's away from the lumen, then we're gonna say it's more basal. So you'll see those terms a lot. Um, and I'm going to use those terms pretty freely, so just make sure you understand what they mean. Apical means towards lumen, basal means away from lumen. Alright, so there's only four types of tissue, so all the tissue that makes up you can be um, categorized in these four categories. Um, so there's epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous, and you can probably guess what a lot of these are going to do. Um, epithelial tissue is mostly going to be used for creating a border or boundary somewhere. Um, you can think about the epithelial or the epidermis of your skin that is epithelial tissue. That's creating a border or boundary from the rest of your tissue in the outside environment. 
Um, but you'll have epithelial tissue creating a border boundary inside your hollowed organs too, separating out that inside lumen from the rest of the tissues. And that's because that inside lumen needs to have different characteristics to its environment than your actual tissues. A good example of this is the stomach. All right? The lumen of the stomach is very acidic, and that um, acidity could break down your tissues of your stomach. So we have this epithelial lining that helps protect all that tissue from that really acidic lumen that we've created. A uh, connective tissue is very diverse. Um, most you're mostly made up of connective tissue, um, and it has the most diverse functions. We'll talk about all the different types. It doesn't just connect things. Uh, muscle tissue going to be used for movement. Um, everything needs to move in order to function. Uh, your stomach moves, right? That needs to churn and um, break down food through mechanical means. So that's going to require some muscle tissue. You have muscle tissue attached to your skeletal system to help you move through the environment. That is your muscular system. So there's definitely muscle all over the body too. And you'll see layers of muscle tissue associated with a lot of these organs. And then finally, we have nervous tissue, which is all about communication because all these organs are going to need to respond to something. All right, so we're still going to follow that same pattern that we talked in the first day of lecture of we're going to have some sort of receptor, some control center, and then some effect. That is all going to require nervous tissue in order to function properly. Okay, um, so one of the things that you will need to do in lab when we um, meet up next week is be able to identify all these different types of tissue under a microscope. I'm going to give a quick breakdown of how to use a microscope when we meet up. Um, but after that, it's up to you to just kind of look at the slides, make sure you can identify it for the practicals in the future, and then be able to answer any of these um, facts about this tissue. Um, so what you need to know is that you need to understand the basic functions of these tissues, which I kind of just covered with covering those four types. Um, you also need to give examples of where we see these tissues. So that will be the slide that you look at. We're going to be using specific organs for these different types of tissues as examples. Excuse me. You also need to identify any additional structures there might be with these tissues. Some, some cells create extra structure, um, and you're going to see this common theme throughout anatomy and physiology is that structure usually equals function. It looks a certain way because of the thing it does. Um, so just make sure you're aware of those special structures, and you need to be able to identify that specific tissue, obviously. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass out a list, and this is also available on Canvas if you want to go along with this video and just follow the list, but there will be an identification list of everything that you're responsible for as far as identifying under a microscope. Now, that's not to say that's everything you need to know for the class or for the practical. That's just what you need to be able to see and tell me what it is, and then from there, answer questions about it. All right, so starting with epithelial tissue, epithelial is mostly going to create a border or boundary to something. So um, most epithelial is going to create a lining or covering. Um, this is going to be true for your skin. You have epithelial tissue or epithelium covering your skin to help protect you from the outside environment, but you also have lining and borders going on in all your hollowed organs as well. Um, there is another type of epithelial tissue that we won't look at in lab, but you should be aware of, and we do talk about it in lecture, and that's glandular epithelium. Uh, glandular epithelium is the cells that are going to make something that is secreted, and that's usually secreted through exocytosis. Um, and that's going to fall into either endocrine or exocrine. Endocrine, it's going to secrete directly into the bloodstream. Exocrine, whatever it creates, is secreted into a duct first and then released to wherever it needs to go. All right, so identifying uh, epithelial tissue is actually really easy. Uh, we only follow two criteria. We look to see how many layers of cells there are and the shape of those cells. Now there is a caveat to this though. We actually need to look at the sides of the cell in order to do that, not the tops of the cell. Um, so this is a good little image here to kind of uh, bring that, that point across. If you looked at the tops of the cell here, all right, like right here or right here or right here, it'd be very hard to tell one from another. So we actually have to look at the sides of the cell. So you can see at the sides of the cells, you can clearly see there's differences in shape and number of layers. So how do we know if we're looking at the side of the cell? Well, all epithelial tissue is supported by connective tissue, and that's because epithelial tissue is avascular. They don't have direct access to blood. Um, so all this connective tissue here, which has a bunch of open space, and we'll talk about that later on in this video, um, has a bunch of nutrients in it and can diffuse those nutrients to the epithelial tissue that is above it or being supported by it. 
And these two will be separated by something called a basement membrane. So the basement membrane is a chemical structure that's produced both by the epithelial tissue and the connective tissue to create that separation. So if you see the basement membrane and connective tissue beyond that epithelial tissue, you know you're looking at the size of the cell. All right, so classification. The first criteria is how many layers are there. If there's a single layer of cells, then we say it's simple. Now, if there's multiple layers, then we say it's stratified. Um, so here's our simple example here. Here's my connective tissue represented in the pink. This line right here would be the basement membrane. Here's my epithelium. And you can see there's a single layer of cells that are making this line. So that would be considered simple. Well, down here, we have multiple layers. We have epithelial cells stacked on top of ep other epithelial cells that is going to be considered stratified. So whenever we have multiple layers, at least two or more, then it's considered stratified. Now, there is a special case, though. It's called pseudo-stratified. This is a case where it looks stratified, but it's not actually stratified. Um, so here is one here that is illustrated. Here's my connective tissue. Here's my basement membrane right here. If you looked at the nuclei of these cells, you can see there's nuclei way up here or down here, and they kind of look stratified. Right? They kind of look like layers. But if you looked at each individual cell, they're all touching the basement membrane. So they're not really stacked on top of each other. Um, so this is actually a simple layer that just looks stratified. So that's why we say pseudo stratified. Pseudo meaning falsely. All right, and the second criteria is the shape of the cell. And again, we're looking at the sides of the cell to determine this. If you looked at the tops of the cell, especially for this illustration, you can see they all look the same. They're all kind of octagonal. Um, but, or hexagonal, excuse me. Um, but if you looked at the sides of the cell, then they're going to be different in shape. So the three major shapes we have is squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. Um, squamous, I, you might want to write down the definition of, because you see it a lot in anatomy. Squama means flat, and these cells are flat. They're much wider than they are tall. All right, the next is cuboidal, and it's cubed shape. And by cubed, we just mean about as tall as it is wide, like a square would. And then the third one is columnar. Columnar means more column shape. Column meaning much taller than it is wide. All right. So again, that's the second criteria, squamous, cuboidal, columnar. Now, there is a special case for this one, too. There seems to always be a special case in biology. Um, here, the special case is called transitional. And transitional is a shape that will change depending on what's going on with the organ, whether the organ is full or empty. We only see these in very specific parts of the body. Um, it's in the urinary system and actually only really found in the ureters and bladder. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get there because that is a special case. All right, so I have this in here as practice just to give you something to work with and try to practice um, these, this terminology. But I'll go through it with you now if you'd like to do it together. All right, so let's take a look at this epithelium here. Down here in this, these squiggly lines representing the connective tissue supporting that epithelium. So this would be the side of the cell here. Um, can you tell what that is without reading it? All right, well, it's a single layer and they're flat. So that's gonna be simple squamous. This one below it, here's our connective tissue. Here's our epithelium. Again, a single layer of cells. So we're gonna be simple again, but here the cells are much, are a little bit taller. So about as tall as they are wide. So this is cuboidal. Uh, below that we have, um, Again, a single layer, so this is simple, but these cells are much taller, so we're going to consider these columnar. And then we get to our special cases. Um, so here we have our pseudostratified. Uh, you can see by the nuclei, the nuclei are all over the place, and that's because they're different sizes of cells. But if you look close enough, each one of the cells are actually touching that basement membrane. They're not really stacked on top of each other, so they're really simple, um, not stratified. So that's why we say pseudostratified or falsely stratified. And typically, when it comes to pseudostratification, um, we follow it by what the dominant cell is. And here you can see the dominant cell is columnar, even though there's a couple of cuboidals in there. All right, so we would consider this pseudostratified columnar. Um, here we have a stratified example. Here's my connective tissue. Here's my basement membrane. And then we have multiple layers of cells in the epithelium, all stacked on top of each other. That's true stratification. Um, but we also need to identify the shape of it. And there is a rule of thumb that we follow when it comes to identifying the shape of the cells when it's stratified. Um, it is going to the apical surface or the surface towards the open space. So that would not be down here. This is more basal. Right? This is actually the basal layer right here. And you can see if we went to the basal layer, we consider cuboidal. But this is actually stratified squamous. 
If you go to the apical layer way up here, that's where you're gonna see that squamous cell. And so that's the rule of thumb that we follow. Strata, so that'd be stratified squamous epithelium. And then finally, we have our other special case, which is transitional cells. Um, since we only see transitional cells in two organs, really, and uh, since they're always going to be stratified, we don't bother saying that. All transitional cells are stratified. So whenever you see transitional, it implies stratification. But here you can see the two types that we, it could be. All right, so this has to do with whether the organ's full or empty. And again, you usually see this in the ureters and bladder. Um, so if the bladder is empty, no urine inside the bladder, everything will spring back to where it's supposed to be. And all the cells are gonna make this kind of round pillow shape right here. And you can see this round shape doesn't really fit those other definitions very well. However, when the organ is full, everything's gonna be, so imagine the, that bladder being full of urine, everything's gonna be stretched to the periphery, right? Pushed off to the sides. When that happens, all these cells are gonna flatten out and stretch. And when they stretch, they actually become more squamous shaped. All right, so when the bladder is extended or full, they're squamous. And when it's empty, then they're going to be more round or pillowy. And you can see they transition from one shape to another. And that's where the term is coming from. All right, so for epithelial tissue, these are the slides that you're responsible for. So when we come back in to lab next week, these are the ones that you need to look at. Um, again, remember, you need to tell me examples of where we see this stuff in the exact, epith um, exact tissue that we're looking at. All right, so for simple squamous, we are going to use frog skin as an example. Um, I am going to, I want to just kind of put an asterisk next to this one. A lot of students are confused at first why I'm using frog skin, but I'll explain it when we get there. Also, it's not going to look simple squamous to you, and um, let me explain why that is when we get to that slide when I show you this image. Um, the, for simple cuboidal, what we're going to use is kidney tubules. Your kidneys are responsible for filtering your blood. If you cut open a kidney, there's millions of little tubules that are running through it that are part of filtration or the filtering of that blood. Um, well, if you took a cross section of those tubes, you would find that simple cuboidal epithelium that is surrounding the lumen of those tubules. Uh, your simple columnar, you are going to look at the jejunum of the small intestine. Your small intestine is made up of three parts. Um, it's the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. Uh, the jejunum is what we're going to look at specifically. Um, but these are going to be your example for simple columnar. Um, for the simple or pseudostratified, we're going to look at a very sp specific type. So you do need to know this whole name for these cells and be able to identify this whole name. So it's going to be pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. All this is saying is that there's cilia on this, these cells, which are hairs that stick off the cells that fan, and they're more columnar shape, even though they're pseudostratified. Uh, for this, we're going to look at the trachea in order to see that because you usually find this only in the or mostly in the respiratory system all right for stratified squamous we're going to look at human skin um, specifically we're going to we're going to look at a scalp slide um, when we come into lab uh, so you're you have this because it's, it's good for protection against abrasion so you usually find stratified squamous cells in anywhere there's going to be abrasion like your skin or in your mouth in your esophagus where you swallow um, places like that and then for transitional, we're going to look at the ureter specifically. So if you remember, the ureter is that little tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. And that will need to be able to stretch. All right, so here is a slide of frog skin. And this is why I want to take a second to explain, because you're probably looking at this and like, this is not simple squamous. All right, why aren't they flat and why, is, why isn't it a single layer? Well, that's because we're actually looking at the tops of the cells here, not the sides. Um, the reason for that is because simple squamous is so thin, you really can't see it with the microscope, or you can't see it effectively enough for it to be useful to you. Um, so we can't really look at the sides of the cell because we just won't be able to see it. Um, so we're looking at the tops instead, and we're going to have to infer that simple squamous by looking at the top, but you could do that, right? Um, if you look at the nuclei of all these cells, you don't see any nuclei stacked on top of other nuclei. And that's because there's a single layer here. There's not multiple layers. So it is simple. And you can see how much light is coming through these cells. All right, and that light is coming through because these cells are really thin. It's really easy for light to pass through it. Um, so that's why they look so transparent. So whenever you see this, and I just tell my students, if you see sunny side up eggs on under the microscope, just know that's frog skin. We're talking about simple squamous there. All right, so that's the only time we're gonna do something like that. Everything else we're gonna see from the side of the cell. 
All right, so here's your example for uh, simple cuboidal. So these are those kidney tubules. So these are some of those millions of tubes that we have in our kidneys that do all filtration. And if you zoomed into these right here, you, this is what you'd see, all right? Here's my lumen of that tube, all right? That open space inside. Here's my epithelium that is separating that lumen from everything else. If you see this dark line right here, that's your basement membrane, okay? And then outside of that is the connective tissue that supports it. So remember, all epithelial tissue is supported by connective tissue. Well, connective tissue, basement membrane, epithelium. So from the basement membrane to the lumen, how many layers of cells do we have here? Well, we only have one, right? There's a single cell right here separating out the basement membrane from the lumen. So that's simple. And it's not perfect, and nothing in biology is perfect, but these cells are about as tall as they are wide which means they're more cuboidal shaped, okay? So this is your example of simple cuboidal. All right, the next one is going to be your jejunum. Um, so when you first put the jejunum under the microscope, your jejunum is a pretty big organ. So you're gonna see a big ring like this. You're gonna have to zoom in to where the epithelium would be. So here I'm zooming in a little bit more. And even then the epithelium is actually really thin, even though they're columnar cells. So you're gonna have to zoom into something like this to really see the cells. But when you do, this is what you'll see right here. That's it, all the way zoomed in. So you have, again, your connective tissue, you have basement membrane, you have your epithelium, and then you have your lumen. That's that open space right here. All right, and then here we have another epithelium and so on, and going on that direction. So we're probably zoomed in somewhere right here where there's a two fingers right next to each other, and we're looking at the lumen in between those two fingers. All right, but again, basement membrane to lumen, we only have a single layer of cells there, and they're all much taller than they are wide. So that is why this is considered simple columnar. Um, a lot of times students get simple columnar and pseudostratified confused. So one of the things I want you to do before we move on is kind of just take a mental snapshot of this image and how it looks. Um, really pay attention to the nuclei of this too. Do you see how in line those nuclei are? They're almost in a perfect straight line. That's because each cell is columnar. When we get to pseudostratified, it looks stratified because the cells are actually just different sizes. So with the pseudostratified, those nuclei are actually all over the place instead of in a perfect straight line like the simple columnar are. All right, so here's other images of the jejunum. You're, again, just to show you, you really have to zoom in here to see that epithelium. And when you do, this is what you'll see. All right, again, you see these straight lines of cells. You see the connective tissue, you see the lumen, and it's hard to see from this staining. Every stain is a little different, but these are much taller cells and they are wide. Um, one other thing that you will need to identify under these microscope slides, that, which will be on the list, are goblet cells. Um, you probably could see goblet cells in the trachea. Um, we do have a lot of goblet cells in the trachea, um, but we also have them in the jejunum. Goblet cells don't stain very well. Um, so you can see these kind of open spaces or these, like it looks like something got skipped in the epithelium. That's actually a goblet cell because it doesn't get stained. Um, these are important for producing mucus. They cre create something called mucin and when it mixes with water, it becomes mucus. You have this all throughout your digestive tract. It helps lubricate the food so the food doesn't cause any abrasion as it's going through your GI tract. Because here we don't have that stratified squamous cells to protect ourselves from abrasion. We have these simple columnar cells that we don't want to lose. So we need to make sure our food is nice and lubricated before it's being passed along this organ. Um, also, you're going to see it in the trachea too. And the trachea does it to catch any debris that you breathe in because your trachea is part of your respiratory system. All right, so here's your trachea now for pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. Once you, when you put first put the trachea under the microscope, this is what you'll see. You need to zoom into this layer right here. This is your epithelial layer. And when you do, this is what it'll look like. So these are two different stains, um, but you can still get the same idea here. You look at these nuclei, they're all over the place. Even though most of the cells look nice and tall, and that's why we say columnar with this, um, but there are some short ones in here too, and making it appear stratified even though it's not. Um, so pseudostratified. It's ciliated, and you can see the cilia here. Those are fine hairs that stick off these cells, and they're mostly columnar shaped. So pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. Um, here, you every once in a while, you should see a goblet cell too. Um, this might be one right here, but you'll, there's better examples that you'll see in lab. Um, and with the trachea, these goblet cells and these cilia kind of work together. Goblet cells are gonna secrete mucus in order to catch any debris or bacteria that you're breathing in frequently. And you need to do something with them, right? Because your respiratory system is a one-way track. It goes into your lungs and it stops. 
Well, what happens is that once you collect all this dust and debris in this mucus, all these hairs, the cilia is going to fan and bead, and they actually move that mucus upwards. And it goes all the way up your trachea, through your larynx, and then turns a corner and goes down your esophagus, and you actually swallow all that mucus. And we make about 40 pounds of this in a year, so this is constantly working. All right, here's another trachea slide. So you're going to zoom in here to see that. And when you do this, you'll see, and this is a nice stain. Um, not all of them are like this, but from the stain, you can clearly see that there's different size cells, but they're not truly stacked on top of each other. They're all touching that basement membrane. So they're actually a simple layer, even though they look stratified, hence the pseudostratified. All right, so your example for stratified squamous epithelium um, is going to be the human scalp. So when you first put the scalp slide on, this is what you'll see. This is the dermal layer. Your dermal layer is not epithelium, all right? This is mostly connected tissue, and this is where you find most parts of skin. So these are little hair follicles here. You can see some glands in the skin spread throughout. We need to go to the epithelium, or ep the epidermis, and the epidermis is right here, which is made up of epithelium. So if you zoomed into this little darker pink layer right here, this is what you'll see, all right? And there's your stratified squamous epithelium. So here is connective tissue underneath it. Here's my basement membrane. And you can see true stratification right here, multiple cells stacking on top of each other. And if you go to, way up here to the apical surface, you see most of the cells are flat or squamous. All right, so stratified squamous. Now, um, you do have to identify two different layers of the stratification. The first layer you need to identify is this one right here that's on the basement membrane. We say this is the mitotic layer because these cells are constantly undergoing mitosis and creating new cells. And that's actually how this whole thing works. So you make a cell down here through mitosis and push that new cell upwards, and it creates this kind of conveyor belt moving upwards, which means the cells way up here are the oldest cells. They were once new down here, but they get kept being pushed upwards, and now they're the oldest. And that's why they become squamous, because they're slowly dying and losing their parts to their cell. And then way at the very top of the skin specifically, you're going to see a dead skin cell layer. We call this the sloughing layer, and it's nothing but the keratin that was left behind by these cells. And it's the sloughing layer because it sloughs off your body frequently. So you're losing these skin cells um, all day long. And it's actually where most of the dust in your house is coming from, is from you losing these cells. All right, um, here's another image of the skin. So dermis here you got to zoom here to see the epidermis or the epithelial layer and you can see the stratification right here and at the top squamous so stratified squamous all right another image just to give you an idea of just as a different stain again stratification here's a really good example of that sloughing layer this is the keratin that's left behind by the dead skin cells that's what's falling off of you frequently and then down here is the mitotic layer which is undergoing mitosis frequently and then the last epithelial tissue is your transitional epithelium. All right, so this is the one that changes shape depending if the organ's full or empty. And again, we really only see this in the ureter and bladder, a little bit in the urethra, but not much. Um, but here it is empty. And you're only going to see the empty version because if you think about how they make these slides, they're going to take this organ, they're going to cut it, a very thin slice of it. When you cut open that organ, the urine is going to come out anyways. So you can't really have a full bladder under a microscope slide. Um, so this is the empty version. Um, again, we're looking at ureters, though, not bladder. And even though it's stratified, we don't bother saying it because transitional is always stratified. And if you go way up here to the apical surface, here's the lumen. If you go to the apical surface, you see these cells look very round and pillowy. So that's the best way to identify them. All right, so here's a ureter. When you first put them under a microscope, you're going to have to zoom in to this layer right here. This is the epithelial layer. Here's my lumen of the ureter, and this is where urine would pass through. Here's my other tissue layers radiating outwards. So if you zoom way into that, this is what you'll see. Here's my connective tissue supporting it. Here's my basement membrane right here, that separation between the epithelium and connective. And then here's my epithelium, clearly transitional cells. Okay, so the second part of this lab is going over connective tissue. All right, so with connective tissue, this is very diverse in function. There's many different types of connective tissue. Um, so we have four major classes when it comes to connective tissue. We have connective tissue proper, we have cartilage, we have bone tissue, and we have blood. So those are four major classes of connective tissue. And you can see they're pretty diverse. I mean, you know what bone is and you know what blood is, and those function very differently, right? But they are both connective tissue. And that's because all of these things have something in common. Well, actually have two things in common. 
Um, one, they all start off as the same tissue when you're a fetus. During development, one of the first connective tissues that we make is something called mesenchyme. Um, you will not have to identify mesenchyme in lab. I don't have any slides for you to see that, but just know all connective tissue starts off as mesenchyme as a fetus. And then as you develop in utero, you are going to start differentiating this mesenchyme into these different types of connective tissue. So whether it be bone, blood, cartilage, or the other types of connective tissue that we find. All right, so that's one thing they have in common. The other thing they have in common, and all connective tissue does this, and it's actually what separates connective tissue from other types of tissue, is that they all make a non-living extracellular matrix. All right, so non-living, it's not gonna be made up of cells. It's actually just chemicals, mostly proteins, um, collagen and elastin. Um, there's other proteins that are involved too in this matrix that we're gonna create. But again, it's not gonna be made up of cells. It's gonna be made up of some sort of uh, chemical. And these chemicals are gonna be found outside the cells that make them. All right, so that's where the extracellular is coming from. They're not made inside the cell, they're made outside the cell. And that's where you'll find it. So you could think of this kind of like um, if the cells of the connective tissue were spiders, they're living in this matrix or like a spider web that they created. So you're gonna see this whole kind of spider web appearance of all these chemicals, fibers that we've created, and you're gonna see the cells kind of just spread throughout that living inside this extracellular matrix. All right, so this is a good illustration to kind of show you what we mean by non-living extracellular matrix. So here's one of the connective tissue cells here. Okay, it is living in this matrix that was created here. So all of these are different types of proteins that are made making these fibers. And so they're kind of living in this matrix of these protein fibers. All right, so the matrix is made up of two parts. All right, we're, we have the fibers here. And then in between the fibers, even though it looks like open space, it's actually not. This open space is actually full of a fluid, and we call that fluid ground substance. And this fluid is where you store a lot of um, nutrients, oxygen, stuff like that can be diffused through this fluid. Um, other things can run through this matrix too, like blood vessels can run through this matrix. You could have fat cells just floating around this matrix, kind of keeping on um, being an energy storage nearby. You could have white blood cells roaming around this matrix, trying to find any foreign bacteria that might have made its way into this matrix that you created. Um, but this matrix was created by these connective tissue cells, and they put all these fibers on the outside. Now, there's three major types of fibers that you need to know, um, and they're pretty easy to identify. They're different. They have a huge difference in size. Uh, so one first one is collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are the biggest. Here's your collagen fiber here. It is mostly made up of collagen. Uh, collagen is very durable. All right? It has a high tensile strength, so it can be pulled without snapping um, pretty well. Um, the next one down is elastic fibers. So these are here, all right? Elastic fibers are made up of elastin, and you could probably guess what this does based on the name. Elastin is really good at being stretched and then causing recoil. So it causes flexibility in this tissue. And then the third one is reticular fibers. These are the smallest. You will not need to identify these under a microscope. They're too small to see with a microscope. Um, we would need electron microscopy to really see them or a very special type of stain. Um, so you don't have to worry about identifying them, but you will have to identify collagen and elastin fiber. And then again, flowing through all this open space is ground substance. And ground substance is the fluid that is going to cover all this open space. So what's going to change between the different types of connection, connective tissues is kind of um, what is going on with these fibers and the ground substance. All right, how much of each do we have and what is it doing? So that's how we differ between the different types of connective tissue. Okay, so in lab, these are the five types of connective tissue that you're going to have to identify. Um, so we're going to look at areolar connective tissue. This is kind of the poster child of connective tissue. Um, you have lots of it in your body, and it looks just like that illustration I just showed you. Um, we're also going to look at adipose tissue. Adipose is kind of a special case. It kind of gets rid of most of its extracellular matrix in order to be able to store more fat. Um, I'll explain more of that when we look at the image of it. Um, both of these are going to fall under the class connective tissue proper. Then we have hyaline or cartilages. The only cartilage we're going to look at in lab is hyaline cartilage, um, which actually is really good at compression and recoil too. Then we have bone tissue. We're going to look at compact bone specifically in here. Um, we're not going to look at spongy bone. And then we have blood, and we're going to look at a blood smear to be able to identify the parts of blood. Okay, so again, you have to tell me the examples of where we see all this. So these are the slides that you're going to look at. Areolar connective tissue is its own slide. Um, the adipose tissue, 
I have slides for them, but I don't like them very much. I don't think they're very good. Um, so I actually suggest going back to the human scalp slide that you looked for stratified squamous to see adipose. That is going to be at the lowest layer of tissue that's in your hypodermis. Your hypodermis is made up of adipose tissue. Um, the hyaline cartilage, you have to go back to the trachea slide. We have these hyaline cartilage rings in our trachea. So you got to go back to that slide in order to view that. Then we have our own slide for bone, osseous tissue, and then we have our own slide for blood. So that's our blood smear slide. All right, so here's our areolar connective tissue, and you can see why I call it the poster child. It is very much like that illustration I just showed you. All right, here are the different cells that are floating around in this matrix. Here are the fibers that are running through it. Here are the open space that is actually full of fluid. That's your ground substance. Okay, so if I point to here on with the microscope on a practical, I'm talking about ground substance. If I'm pointing to these, I'm talking about the fibers. But can you identify these individual fibers? Now remember, there's three, but you only need to identify two. So these big pink ones, those are going to be your collagen fibers. Remember, those are the biggest. And then these thinner purple ones will be your elastin or elastic fibers that are full of elastin. You will not see reticular fibers because they're too tiny. So don't worry about identifying those. All right, one last thing that you will need to do with all this connective tissue is identify the types of cells that make it, okay? Um, so an easy way to remember this is that um, the suffix that we use in anatomy for cell is site, C-Y-T-E. And then usually the prefix that we put in front of it tells you what that cell is doing. So here, these are gonna be fibrocytes, okay? I know they say fibroblast here. I'll talk about more what a blast is in the lecture, um, but fibroblasts will turn into fibrocytes. So the, they're living in this matrix. They're considered a fibrocyte. All right, when you first put the areolar connective tissue under the microscope, this is what you see. You have to zoom in, all right? And once you zoom in, then you'll see all these different structures. You'll see elastic fibers, collagen fibers, ground substance, and these fibrocytes that are spread throughout. All right, the next one for connective tissue proper is adipose tissue. Um, this one gets rid of most of its extracellular matrix because it needs to store fat. All right, so this is what it looks like under a microscope. Um, you store fat in a vacuole inside the cell. All right, so the fat's not actually stored outside the cell, it's stored inside the cell in a big vacuole. A vacuole is just a giant vesicle. And so that vacuole gets so big, it pushes all the parts of the cell to the plasma membrane. It spreads it out to the periphery. So here's a single cell right here, okay? This is the fat vacuole where the fat droplet was. It pushed everything off to the side. So here's the nucleus of the cell right here, pushed it against the sides of the cell. And here's another one. You can see the nucleus pushed off the side of the cell here too. And because it does this and it makes room by just expanding inside the cell and pushing off to this, everything off to the side, it makes this really unique shape to the cell, all right? And we have a name for it. It's called a signet ring shape. A signet ring is a ring that has a band and an emblem on it, like a class ring. Um, so if you ever think of a class ring, that is a signet ring, and that's where this name is coming from. All right, so the signet ring, here's the band, which would be the plasma membrane. Here is the emblem, the nucleus pushed off to the side. Now, something that's interesting with fat or adipose tissue, um, if we gain weight or lose weight, it doesn't actually change the number of cells that are there. Right? It's actually the size of the cells that changes or how big that um, fat vacuole is. All right, so if, we're, um, if we have more weight, then we're going to actually expand that vacuole pretty um, largely. And then if we lose weight, then we actually shrink those vacuoles. Okay, so for this, I do have slides for adipose, but I don't like how they came out. They, didn't, they don't look that good. So I would go see the skin or the human scalp for this one. If you go down to that hypodermis layer, then you'll see these fat layers. And they're pretty easy to identify because they kind of make this honeycomb appearance. And that's because when we stain these, we wash away the fat vacuole, and it's just that open space that's left behind. All right, so again, here's adipose tissue. And if you zoom way in, then you can clearly see that signet ring shape. All right, and here's that nucleus and the plasma membrane. Now, again, you do need to know the names of these cells, which are pretty straightforward. If you remember what the suffix of cell was, was site, right? C-Y-T-E. And what do you think the prefix for these cells are going to be? It's going to be adipo. Okay, so they're considered adipocytes, and that's what makes up adipose, which is the tissue. All right, then we have hyaline cartilage. Um, this one you have to go back to the trachea for. If you remember with the trachea, we had the pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells up here. You're going to have to go down a couple tissue layers until you get to here. This is your hyaline cartilage. Now, cartilage does something unique 
that other connective tissues don't. Um, they create all this collagen, these collagen fibers, but then those fibers fuse together and create more of a mat instead of just being individual fibers. Now we have a sheet of fibers or a sheet of collagen instead of individual fibers. And it creates this kind of stained glass appearance. So I think this is pretty easy to identify. All right, depends on the stain, so don't go by color. Um, but you can see the matrix for each one of these looks like stained glass. Now with these um, hyaline cartilage, because this is like a mat, nothing can move around this matrix. All right, they're kind of, the cells are stuck there permanently. All right, so it's, we need to make room for these cells in this matrix. So there's these carve outs everywhere in this matrix, this open space, these open cavities that will house the cells. So we have a term for these um, open cavities. We call them lacunae or lacuna for singular. Lacunae means small lakes in Latin. And it's because whoever discovered this thought it looked like an aerial view of lakes, like from a helicopter looking down at, on the earth. And I kind of agree with that. It does look like small lakes. So that's where the name is coming from. And then inside that lacuna is where you're going to find the cells. All right. And again, you need to know the names of the cells of these. So again, suffix is going to be site. Um, but the prefix, um, you might remember from our first day in lab, I talked about what cartilage was in Latin. And if you remember, cartilage is chondra. So these are going to be considered chondra sites. We talked about it when we talked about the hypochondriac region of your abdominal cavity. All right. So again, when you put the trachea on, um, this is what you saw for the pseudostratified. You're going to go down a couple tissue layers to here. Here is your hyaline cartilage layer. You zoom all the way in. This is a different staining, so it doesn't look exactly like that other image, but you can clearly see the kind of stained glass matrix. That's all that collagen that's fused together. And we can see these open spaces, the lacuna, and we can see the nuclei of the chondrocytes. All right, the next one is compact bone. Um, this one is going to take extra explanation because bone is a little bit more complex than these other tissues. Um, so how your compact bone grows, it grows in tubes that fuse together. So you can see the individual tubes here. So these tubes run the length of the bone, and then they all fuse together, and that's how compact bone is made. So we're taking cross sections of these tubes. All right, so how this works is that you have these little channels that are in the center of these tubes that we call central canals. Um, you're going to see on your list, they're also called Herbacean canals. That's named after the scientists that discovered them. Um, but we're trying to get away from naming things from after scientists. So uh, it's more commonly used to, or what is more commonly said is central canal, not herbacean canal. Uh, but in this canal is blood vessels and nerves that run through the bone. All right. So it's open space to allow blood vessels to run through and nerves. Now, outside of that, this is where you get the matrix. So your matrix is made up of cells that have released collagen, just like we saw before, but that collagen binds to calcium. And when the collagen and calcium bind together, they make this really hard matrix. So that's what all this white part is, is that calcium matrix that's mixed in with the collagen. So again, extracellular matrix, not living. All right, your bone is constantly growing and shrinking depending on your body's calcium needs. All right, if you need calcium, you're going to take it from your bone and put it in your blood. So that's going to cause the bones to shrink. And if you have too much calcium, then you'll store calcium in the bones, which will cause the bones to expand. Um, so since we do this, the cells that live in this matrix need to be alive, all right? So they're not dead cells here. They're going to be living, and they're just kind of stuck in this hard matrix. All right, so here you can see all these little dark spots here. These are, again, openings that house the cells. So, again, we're going to call these lacunae, or lacuna for singular, all right? So this is just an open cavity. That's where the cell is going to be found. And you could probably guess the name of the cell that is going to be found here. Again, suffix is going to be site. And if you've noticed the trend here, the prefix for this is going to be osteo. Okay, so the cells here are called osteocytes. And these are the ones that are going to add or take away calcium as needed. Now, since these are living cells, they need access to blood. All living cells need access to blood somehow. Well, they get their blood from the central canal. So blood's coming in through these blood vessels, but that blood still needs to make it through this matrix to the cells in the lacunae. So that is going to be done through these little spider cracks that are in the matrix. You might be able to see them here that we see these little spider cracks. All right, we have a name for these too. We call them canal liculi, which means little canals. So what happens is blood will percolate through these canals and reach every single one of the osteocytes that are in bone. 
right? So that's how they're staying alive. And the last thing you need to know about this is how this unit grows. So we have a term for this repeating tube that we see in the compact bone. We call it an osteon, all right? So this is an osteon right here. Here's another osteon. And osteons grow in rings radiating outwards from that central canal. All right, so we have a term for these rings, and that's actually how it grows. It starts off around that blood vessel, and then they start adding matrix around it. Um, so the term for these rings is lamellae, so, or lamella for singular. And it's kind of like the rings of a tree. You can think of it that way. So lamellae are these tree rings radiating outwards in this osteon. Okay, so just to um, give you some other slides, because not all slides are created equal, right? So here's a different slide with slightly different stain. You can see an osteon right here. You can see another osteon here. All right, so we're zooming into those. And if you zoom into the osteon, you can see the tree rings. These are your lamellae, okay? It's radiating outwards. You can see the central canal here that would have the blood vessels and veins. You can see all these lacunae here, 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 housing all the osteocytes. And you can see the canal liculi, all these little spider cracks that connect all of these cells to the central canal, where they can have access to blood. All right, again, canal liculi here, you can see all these spider cracks, lacuna, central canal. All right, then the last connected tissue that we need to look at in lab is blood. Um, blood is connected tissue. It has a non-living extracellular matrix, and you could probably guess what that non-living extracellular matrix is, is of blood. It is your plasma. Plasma is a ground substance. Remember, there's two parts to extracellular matrix, fibers and ground substance. Well, that's what that plasma is, is that ground substance. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have fibers, though. All right, the fibers are solubilized in this plasma, so they're kind of in solution. So they're not solid yet. That, those fibers will come out of solution, though, and that's actually what clotting is. So when you have an open wound in a blood vessel, those fibers will come out of solution and they'll be collagen fibers making a little matrix over that wound. But until that happens, they stay solubilized in this plasma, the ground substance. All right, so besides just the pla or the ground substance, you also have to identify the cells that make up blood. Um, it's pretty easy though, all right? There's only three. So you have red blood cells, you have white blood cells, and you have platelets, okay? So platelets are these little tiny flakes right here. You'll see floating around blood. They also help with clotting. Red blood cells are these right here. They lack a nucleus, so that makes them really easy to identify. Um, they get rid of their nucleus at maturity to be able to store more oxygen because these are the ones transporting most of your oxygen in your body. And then here's our white blood cells. And white blood cells still have a nucleus. And that's because they have to constantly make proteins in order to fight bacteria. All right, so another blood smear, just to keep practicing this. Um, do not worry about identifying the different types of white blood cells, and do not worry about the Latin name for white blood cell. You'll get into that in AP2. You could just say white blood cell for AP1. Um, but if you are curious, um, white blood cells are leukocytes, all right, and leuco means white, site means cell. Well, red blood cells are called erythrocytes. Erythro means red, and again, cells. And then we have thrombocytes as platelets, but again, you can just use the term platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. And make sure you can identify ground substance, which is the plasma. All right, so that's everything. Um, also want to remind everybody that there's a quiz next class um, when we meet. We're going to do it the first 15 minutes of class. This is going to be on everything that we covered on the first day of the lab because that information is so important. Um, so make sure you study that first PowerPoint really well. So anything from that PowerPoint is fair game. It's mostly going to be terminology, but um, the torso model is going to be on there. The organ systems are going to be on there. The planes, directional turns, all that stuff could be on there. All right, so just make sure you're studying that. Nothing from this lab will be on there. Or nothing from the tissue lab, I should say. All right, so that's it for this video. I will make another video for what we should cover in lab next class, but this way we could, um, you could all watch the videos at home and we could spend that whole time looking at all these slides instead of kind of being pressed for time. Um, so make sure you watch both videos before coming in next class.